Please turn your Bibles to the Old Testament. Our text will come from Proverbs 2, 1 through 6. As far as an introduction to the matters that we will consider in another part of Proverbs. Proverbs 2, 1 through 6. The scripture reads, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, lift us up thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding." It is God Almighty who teaches us wisdom. Wisdom, fundamentally, is how to use knowledge and apply it properly. And it's God's Word that enlightens us on those things. Here we are on the first Lord's Day of a new year. And we know not what the year shall bring. Now last Sunday I could have said, here we are on the last Sunday of an old year, and we don't know what next week's going to bring. The truth of the matter is, we don't know what today's going to bring. But isn't it wonderful to be able to know who controls all? Think of the song we just sung, He Hath Not Forgotten Thee. He does, as the old song many, many years ago said, he holds the whole world in his hand. We need to understand the design and purpose of life and the flesh on this earth. Most people don't. Even many who are Christians don't. Life on earth is to prepare for eternity. Now, what's involved in the preparation is one thing, but that sums it all up. If you do not use your life to prepare for eternity, you flunk the course in life, and that's an eternal if. We need to know wisdom. We need to have wisdom. We need to exercise wisdom. And what's interesting is that God instructs us in so many ways, of course, it's all in the words of the Bible. Words are signs of ideas. You want to know the idea of God? You have to read the Word of God because He put His ideas into words, vehicles of thought. Thus, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works or every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's inspired of God. Theophanusnoth, breathed out from God, from the depths of God's being, comes the Bible, if you please. And it's designed to lead and guide and direct us through this life of the flesh. And our being faithful to God based upon it, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, heaven will be our home. He has not forgotten thee. And so if he, being omniscient, and he is, knowing all things that are the object of knowledge, knows all that the song a moment ago sang about, and even more, then we need to understand that he knows what you need and I need. And how he chooses for us to understand it is quite interesting. And he chooses the most simple thing things that many people won't pay any attention to. And so we turn to inspiration in the book of Proverbs, of course, and we find that inspired Agur, A-G-U-R, the son of Jacob, provides words of wisdom for all of us. And this seems to be an appropriate way to start off a new year or to start off any day. And many of these appropriate words are given in the form of lists. 
lists of words. Notice now in Proverbs, go several chapters over, chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. And let's see how he goes about teaching wisdom to us. Looking at verse 24, Proverbs 30, beginning verse 24, inspiration says there, are, there be four things which are little upon the earth. Now stop right there a moment. Men tend to look at all sorts of things and the big things, the difficult things, the intricate things provide knowledge and wisdom. But notice how inspiration started here. He says, a little upon the earth. I'm going to teach you about wisdom by looking at little things on the earth. They are exceeding wise, he says. Now just think, when God created what he's about to mention here, he knew he would use this in teaching about wisdom. He says, the ants are a people not strong, yet prepare their meat in the summer. He says, the conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. Then he says, the locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. And then the spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Again, that's Proverbs 30. 24 through 28. Now remember, when God created these things, He knew He would use them to teach mankind wisdom. We often use things of that nature, things around us, to say, do you learn from that? Will that help you better? Isn't that interesting how this happened? Or whatever. But let's look at what they list and let's note them one by one. Notice the ant. Now, you have to realize he uses them in a certain way. He's not talking about the ant stinger. He's not speaking of fire ants and stinging. Although what he has to say about ants would apply to the fire ant, too, or any other ant. So comparatively speaking, among God's creatures, ants are quite small and quite weak. Now, for their size, they're terribly powerful. But... Look at them as far as what you can do to them. You can crush hundreds of them with your feet in just a matter of a second. But the ant survives. How is that the case? The point made here about the ant is preparation. That's what the ant does. That's the wisdom that the ant brings to you and me. And what better time on this first Sunday of the new year to talk about meeting the things of this year, whatever they have to offer. You know, we may not even see the year through. God may send his son back before the year's over. We may all die before the year's over. But the point is, whatever time we have left on this earth, knowing that we're to live our lives here to prepare to meet our God, and that's what God intends for us to do, then we can understand something. God says about the ants, and that would be preparation. Again, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, he says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. We might say, you lazy bum. <laughs> Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, Provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. What does that tell me about life? Now, Jesus said we should just simply live one day at a time. That helps destroy anxiety about what may be tomorrow. Because sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So if this whole year we should live through it, it will because we lived each day like the Lord said ready to meet whatever there is that's coming our way. Remembering that the devil is a roaring lion is our adversary and he goes about seeking whom he may devour. He will be here all day long. And we're taught to resist the devil. He'll flee from us. We need to know how to resist him. And we're taught to draw nigh to God and he'll draw near to us. And we need to know how to draw near to God. Part of it is to be a wise person. Part of it is to be 
prepared. I don't know how many gospel sermons have been preached in gospel meetings and otherwise that have talked about be prepared. Are you prepared? And we sing songs, prepare to meet thy God. So the ant uses the time and opportunities given to prepare for those difficult and hard times. Now God created that ant to work the way he did. He gave him the genetic code that produces the ant or various species of ants and they all do this they use the times for, that are meant for preparation and guess what they prepare what about us here we are so intellectual and so far above an ant what do we do with life if i would preach anything to dave that would help you the rest of the year it would be to prepare prepare to meet thy god you can't prepare tomorrow You'll never live in tomorrow because when you get there, it's today. And you certainly can't go back to yesterday. It's gone forevermore. So today is the only day you can make choices to serve God or not. So go to the ant. And we have limited time to make preparations. That's built into the ant by God. And the time he has to prepare for whatever ants do, he uses it. What about us? Look all around you. Look at every person around you. They're most of them not really living this life to get ready to meet God. Part of the work of the church is to call that to people's attention. To cause people to realize they need to prepare to meet thy God. How they prepare to meet their God and how they use each day to prepare to meet their God. But above all, we who have heard, believed, and from the heart obeyed the gospel and been baptized into Christ, we certainly need not lose sight of that. We ought to build upon it every day. Because we too have limited time to make preparations. To get ready, in other words, to meet our God. Man that is born of woman is a, a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower. And he's cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. Job 14, 1 through 2. Everybody here that's over 50. Now those be over 50, you just don't worry about it. Take that in the context of what you said. How long ago does it seem like that you were 20 years old, 25, or having your babies born, new jobs, starting out on life? Just blink an eye, but here we are. And so I go back then before 50 to 40 to 30 to 20 into the teens. Are you preparing in those years to get ready to meet God? You know, you, you may never become an old person. Just remember that. When you see an old person that's decrepit, like Ken, I mean, like me, <laughs> I'll leave Buddy alone. I'll pick on him up. <laughs> Remember, when you think of us, you may never get here, you young whippersnapper. <laughs> we have gone through those years thinking if we were serving God all that time, we may not see 30 years old. We may not see 25 years old. We may not see 35 years old. And looking back over my life, there's a host of folks that I went to school with. They never got there. Two or three of my best friends in school never lived beyond age 25. That's a long time ago. When we knew them, who thought about it? I posted a little thing the other day on Facebook that basically said there'll be a time that you play with your friends for the last time and you won't know it. You'll get with them, you'll play with them, but after that, you'll have gone your separate ways and that ends that. But to make it more important, that'll be the same way true of husbands and wives and parents and children. It's just the way life is. So what should we be doing? Well, I know what Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Romans 6, or rather, Matthew 6, 33. Sadly, most people prepare for the wrong things. Remember the farmer who was turned inwardly, and he was about as selfish as you could get? He had a great, great crop, and didn't have enough 
barns to hold all that he raised. So I'll tell them my barns build bigger barns and say, so look at what I've got. And so I, 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 uh, he had to be an American. And what was flying above those barns was the American flag. That's exactly what was there. Because I, I, I'm going to get, 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 and have, have, have. You remember what God told him? Thou fool. This night shall thy soul be required of thee. Is that going on in heaven about me right now? Well, I hope it's not concerning me a fool. And I might pause here and throw this in incidentally. If you want to have a good Bible study, just study who God calls a fool and the kinds of fools inspiration sets out here. And then study it with the idea, I don't want to be that, as far as it used in a bad connotation. Luke 12, 15 through 21. We don't want to be that way. For mankind, what's the important thing? Where will I be in eternity? But I dare say most people never think of it. Few fail to plan for eternity. They make no proper preparations for their existence after the death of their physical body. They just don't think about it if they can. They spend their lives running from the fact that I'm going to die. Running from the fact that I will always continue, just not always in this body. And always on this earth. And I have a choice while on this earth as to how I live, whether I'll be in glory by and by or be in torment. That's up to me. I know how God wants it. God's done everything possible to save a free moral agent. I must choose. It may be that they have deceived themselves into thinking uh, that they have plenty of time, plenty of time to prepare later. I don't know of a greater deceptive effort that Satan has other than to use that on all of us, cause us to think that I'll take care of that tomorrow, the next day, whatever that is. It never comes. And that's why we're taught today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. When you learn your duty to God, God is not obligated to offer you another chance tomorrow, next week, and so on. You must respond to the gospel invitation when you have the opportunity. James put it this way, and he wrote to Christians, remember, when he wrote this in James 4, verses 13 through 17. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what will be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Here's what ought to be, he says. For ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. And that's the way it ought to be in all of our plans, if the Lord will. James 4, 13 through 17. In other words, most pass up the opportunity to prepare. Well, it's life in the flesh on this earth and the time I have here that I'm to prepare. If I pass that up, there is no other place to prepare. It's so easy to focus on the immediate needs and not look ahead. That's America. Oh, they talk about the future and retirement and all sorts of funds that you can lay up money and all this kind of thing. You ever read the book of Ecclesiastes? It talks about the folks laying up all those things, and then you die, don't get any of it. Somebody else takes it and goes with it. We're taught all through the Bible how to use what we actually possess as good stewards. So whatever we have of this world's good, then we should take care of it in the light of spreading the gospel and edifying the saints. It's so easy to focus then on those immediate needs. And we must understand that it's a sin to pass up the opportunity to do right. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. As you therefore have opportunity, do good to all men, especially those household of faith. Well, the opportunity we have to prepare for God is in this life. It's today. It's not tomorrow. It's not next week. It's today. And James talks about that in verse 17 of what I just said. Eventually, and usually much sooner than we think, the time to prepare moves on and it's all gone 
I take you back again to the Old Testament. Think of the hundreds of years that fleshly Israel existed and the many opportunities they had to serve God faithfully. And what did they choose to do? They chose to serve idols and get mixed up in all the wickedness that's involved in idolatrous worship of that time. <clears throat> eventually, eventually, their opportunity to make the necessary changes to be acceptable to God ran out. This is Jeremiah in the besieged city of Jerusalem. Besieged by Babylon, the hand of God to destroy impenitent Israel. Listen to him lament. The harvest is past. The summer is ended, and we are not saved. <clears throat> well, the same is true for us in spiritual Israel and for people living today who need to prepare by believing and obeying the gospel. In other words, eventually all of us reach a point of no return. Job put it this way. <clears throat> Job 16, 22. When a few years are come, then I shall go to the way whence I shall not return. Guess what? This is the point Jesus made. And he makes, if you please. In his parable of the wise and foolish virgins found in Matthew 25, 1 through 13. <clears throat> The foolish were those who did not use their time to prepare for the bridegroom. That's the way Jesus taught it. And in so many ways, what do you see when you look at an ant the next time you see one? Then he mentions the conies. Well, a coney is also called in some places a rabbit. It's called a rock badger. Best we know, it's a small rabbit-like mammal that's called the Syrian rock Hyrex. We would say it doesn't even trust its own strength. And because of that, it lives among the rocks. I think I saw a National Geographic thing that talked about that one time. And he does. He lives among the rocks because that's where his protection is. He knows it. He knows he can't protect himself as he is. So he learns where to live. He learns what will protect him. And he's wiser in that than we are many times. In Psalm 104, verse 18, the high hills are refuge for the wild goats and the rocks for the conies. You know what's wrong with a lot of us, at least in America, but it's true of the whole world. We are confident in our own abilities, too confident in our abilities. There's nothing wrong with being confident enough to step out and do what God commanded us to do, but it's in that area we rarely do that. And I call your attention to David again. <clears throat> David wasn't overly confident. When he reviews how he killed a bear and killed a lion, he knows God delivered them into his hands, and his view is, and rightly so, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defile the armies of the living God? God did that for me as a shepherd, taking care of my father's flocks with the lion and the bear. He'll do that with Israel, the God's sheep of that day. It was very simple thinking, but it was right. So he had confidence, but it was confidence in whom? God. That as I obey God, everything takes care of itself, and God will take care of me. Listen to what he said in Proverbs 28, 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. These fools keep showing up, don't they? And, uh, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. So only a fool trusts in himself and needs nobody else. It's always been interesting to me that when God created man, male, he created woman, female. He says, it's not good for a man to be alone. I'll create him and help suitable for him. And he did. It's not that it's a sin necessarily to be alone. Paul elected to do so because it would help him better serve the Lord in being alone in view of the persecutions he would undergo and thereby not be able to perform what God required of a husband and a father. And thus he chose to do that. But normally, it's not good for a man to be alone. 
We shouldn't therefore berate the husband by the wife doing it or the husband berating the wife. We should thank God for them. And we should seek to find a wife like the Bible says in Proverbs 31. Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. That means without God. We all are to understand the truth. Paul said, I wrote unto you what I wrote. You'll, you read it, you'll understand my mystery. So he's not talking about living in ignorance of God and the way to prepare. He is talking about not trusting in yourself to the exclusion, or when you do, to exclude revelation. It's too much said how we need the Word of God and to follow it, to say that that understanding covers that. No, he's saying you cannot in and of yourself alone, independent of the truth of God's Word, make it to heaven. He says, can't you see the coney? He knows better. He's got enough sense to go get in the rocks where he'd be protected because he can't protect himself. In Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24, Thus saith the Lord, the great prophet said, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So boast not in our own abilities. Don't take pride, if you please, and be puffed up according to our abilities. But glory in the Lord. And how do we do that? Leaning on the everlasting arms. We sing that song, you know. Depending on God. How can I do that without a knowledge of God's will and learning what He wants me to do in this time of preparation, even how to prepare? God is our rock. Psalm 62, 5 through 8. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. But we don't take note of that. And again, the conies rise up and condemn us because He knows where He needs to be to get the protection He can't provide for Himself. In Isaiah 26, 3-4, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Well, let's leave the little conies and let's go to the locust. Now, I grew up thinking that the cicada was a locust, but he's not. He's like a big old locust is, like a big old grasshopper, only they come in great swarms in that part of the world, and today even in Africa and the east. They're about three inches long, and they're there by the billions. And without any organization or ruler, these great swarms of locusts can cover wide areas and completely devour everything in their path. They're more destructive than an army. And how is it accomplished? They show the strength of unity. The Bible has a lot to say about unity. The day of God's judgment is described as a locust swarm. We studied that a while back in Joel. Joel 2, verses 1 through 11. Just devours everything in his path. These little three-inch bugs, but there's so many of them doing the same thing. Thing. Working together provides strength beyond the individual members. Right of Ecclesiastes spent a lot of time on that. Ecclesiastes 9 through 12, we'll not read it now. But we all know intellectually what unity is. The same mind and the same judgment. And that's why unity is urged upon among brethren. Satan can and does pick us off one at a time 
but united, we are a formidable army that goes to victory. I was noticing something other day in Civil War reading that a major general of the Union Army in a certain battle, they were under heavy fire and they were Confederate sharpshooters. And the men would flinch where he was every time they'd fire and he was going to show great boldness and rode up to them and said, they're too far away, they couldn't hit an elephant. About that time it was out, right upside the head and he was gone. Somebody said, well, they might not hit an elephant, but they know how to hit major generals. And so it is with us. We might understand fellowship better among Christians. If we realize it's not all potato salad and beans. That's a result of fellowship, you know. When we sit down to eat together, that's the result of being one, of the same mind and the same judgment, the same sentiments. But all of that that really matters is where we are now and what we'll do when we leave. And we're so much one that we don't want to be apart. And so we have admonition from in 1 Corinthians 1.10, be of the same mind and same judgment. On matters of obligation to God, agree to obey God. I'm not talking about opinions, likes, and dislikes. We don't let them come between us and God. We unite upon what's authorized, Colossians 3.17. We must work to preserve the bond of peace between us. That's what Paul said in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. And Jesus taught, as was used by Abraham Lincoln in Matthew 12.25, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And that was said first regarding God's people. Just think how much can be accomplished with united effort. One of the first things we do, whether we're elders, deacons, Bible school police, teachers, preachers, whatever our part in the church is in being faithful to Him and spreading the gospel, living the Christian life every day at home, is just forget about who gets the credit for doing good. Give God the glory, obey His will, and do good. If somebody else gets a pat on the back for doing basically what you started, fine. Just do what's right. Let come what may. The walls of Jerusalem were restored in really an amazingly short time. And they did it while under great threat of being attacked. The MI 4, 6 and chapter 6 verses 15 through 16. For the people had a mind to work. They all had a mind to work. Each one doing what he could to build those walls. And they worked while they had their weapons at their side. So they had to stop building to go fight to be able to build again. They did. They didn't think that a strange thing. So many times in Israel they hadn't done this. And so many times in spiritual Israel, all sorts of things divide us. But much can be accomplished with united effort. We are the locust raiding the fields of Satan. And know what we can accomplish if we have the mind to work. But then he talks about the lizard. Some say spiders, I read. It doesn't make any difference with a spider or a lizard. It all comes out to teach the same thing. Same point is made. What's that point? Well, in warm regions, even as we are around here to some extent, just not today, <laughs> lizards are found everywhere, and so are spiders. Even though they're easily caught, they still reappear. Even the king's palace is not free of them, is the way the writer rights well now this brings up something how am I to learn something from this with the spider or lizard when he says even the king's palace has you ever heard persistence are you a persistent person it means that you get after it and you won't stop you're not going to let anything stop you you know God likes to see that even when we petition him Persistence pays off. We understand that trials mold us, makes us. As through those trials, we continue to keep the commandments of God. The church was persecuted after the death of Stephen. Because of that persecution, the whole church went everywhere except the apostles. And they went everywhere preaching the word. Just because they believed the word and were persecuted to where they had to leave their homes, they still had confidence in God through the gospel, and they continued to preach it. 
And Hebrews 12, 5 brings up the idea that we should not despise the chastening of the Lord. It all works for our good. Just because we're suffering through things doesn't mean the Word of God's changed or God doesn't exist anymore. Or Jesus isn't who He claims to be or what He teaches in His New Testament. Just draw near to Him. That's what it's designed to do. Lo and behold, in this life, in the flesh, as we love the truth, study it, know it, and live it, and defend it, and all this trouble comes upon us, you know how you become pure gold when that happens? And Peter talks about Christians being tried as gold as by fire. It just makes you draw closer to God. That's all there is to it. You just cannot give up doing good. And Paul made that clear in Galatians 6, 9 through 10. Use the time we got. It's all going to see someday. There won't be that person to visit in the sense of providing what they can't provide for themselves because of their circumstances. There won't be that orphan. There won't be this time to fund the spreading of the gospel. There won't, none of that will be there. It'll all be gone. These things fit the situation of the opportunity to mold ourselves in the likeness of Christ. He that would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. Well, that time's ceasing someday. The time of the proving ground will end. We cannot become tired of teaching the truth, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. The more it's rejected, the more we ought to be persistent in teaching it. We cannot become tired in defending the truth. The more people reject it and fight against it, well, we just continue to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Our labor in the Lord and being faithful to Him and all God says is a good work or works is not useless. It's not pointless. And Ken quoted this the other night, and I've quoted it most often. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. To be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why do we let this world that God has given for us to live in to prepare ourselves for heaven cause us to not prepare ourselves for heaven? There's a reward awaiting those faithful unto death. That, that too was referred to by Ken the other night in his talk. And I do prefer because it's more, as he said then, in harmony with the Greek, be thou faithful, U-N-T-O, unto death. It certainly covers the idea of living 100 years and dying faithful in your bed. But it also says if I must give up my life in the flesh on earth rather than compromise the truth, I give up my life on earth and stay hold of the truth. And that's what he was saying in view of the dire persecutions that was coming upon the church then. So can we learn from spiders and lizards and conies and things like that? Can we learn? Well, God, in, by inspiration, certainly thought we could and said, look at them and learn. You'll be a better person for it. You'll use your life as God intended to draw an eye to God, to spend more time with the Bible, studying what's right, to worship God more acceptably, to hide yourself in the Savior and flee to the rock that is higher than I. There's our salvation, there's our strength, and why not begin this first day of the year reminding us of that as we assemble to worship God in this assembly. And if people choose not to assemble with the saints, those who have said they're Christians and have obeyed the gospel, they need to look to some little animal somewhere and learn something because they don't seem to see otherwise. And God says, look what you can learn, if you will. If you're not a child of God this morning, we beg of you to believe in Christ with all your heart, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be buried with your Lord in baptism to become a Christian. There's no other way to do so. That's the way God will forgive your sins. As a child of God, if you haven't been considering what makes you wise, and you've stumbled back off into sin, or maybe it hadn't been a stumble, maybe you just walked into it with eyes wide open, we urge you to repent of those sins. Pray God for forgiveness, having confessed them. And now, what better time is it? Today is the day of salvation, and now is the accepted time. Why not come to Christ while we stand and sing?